So my voice hasn't been as uh, good as it should be. So uh, I like having a remote mic because I tend to walk around a lot, kind of French, you know, and wave my arms and such. Uh, Pennsylvania, of course, got its first cases of CWD in uh, 2012. I started sampling back in 1998. This gives you an idea of, of how the sampling progressed through time. Now, I'm from Vermont originally. Uh, I've been down in this job. Well, I, I got to Pennsylvania about two years and two months ago. I came down as the uh, Wildlife Bureau Director, but um, I was formerly the Executive Director or the Commissioner of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department from 2003 to 2011. So I, I dealt with um, CWD when it first showed up uh, in New York and, and uh, Wisconsin. We put in place parts bans. Uh, we banned feeding and baiting. Um, and so, uh, of course, that was controversial. So uh, I was engaged in, in all those issues uh, back early on. So I came down here as the Wildlife Bureau Director and started, you know, I wasn't even on my radar. And I was here about a month and all of a sudden, several new cases of, of CWD in Pennsylvania. So now it's on my radar and I'm saying, whoa, what's going on? Um, and really uh, all that had been going on is surveillance. And uh, so we've uh, started to try to move away from that to, to trying to do some active management. So you can see uh, early on, we started sampling as early as 1998. Uh, and then as uh, the various events occurred, 2001, of course, uh, it ramped up and 2004, 2005 ramped up uh, until, and basically during that time, our sampling was, our sampling was about 3,000 deer uh, across the state with a 57% uh, chance of detecting a 1% prevalence with a 95% confidence. And of course, I'm arguing now these days that uh, you know we've got a bunch of assumptions that are involved in all these statistics, random sampling, random distribution of animals that um, make some of that problematical. But at any, at any rate, um, up to this point in time, not counting uh, 2017, uh, we've tested over um, 60,000 deer in Pennsylvania. Now, just for perspective, we have a deer population that's on the order of 1.4 to 1.5 million. I think last year, the deer that we know about being harvested uh, tallied about 345,000. So uh, we've got a lot of deer in Pennsylvania. Um, of course, that was our portion of the, of the testing. Uh, also testing going on with the surveyed operations through the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. We do not, Pennsylvania Game Commission, um, used to have control over surveyed operations, but uh, that was uh, removed to PDA uh, back before CWD showed up in the state. And uh, they nicely put into statute that the Game Commission shall have nothing to do with survey operations. So we can't even work cooperatively with PDA um, to, to help them. Although we have an extremely good uh, relationship with PDA, we're working together everywhere that we can, um, but uh, uh, we can't cooperate um, uh, in helping them uh, either enforce fence restriction you know, or fence uh, regulations or anything like that. So this gives you an idea of our testing since we uh, had our first three positives in 2012. And uh, you know where do they fall out? You can see we've got uh, 61 positives. This is all in our DMA, one, uh, DMA2, which uh, extends from the Maryland border uh, northwards. And uh, it began in Bedford and Blair counties and now expanded out into Franklin and Fulton counties. And you can see hunter harvested a uh, roadkill being uh, uh, a lot uh, more of those. If you look down at the bottom, you can see that uh, um, going back and referencing the number of samples taken, the, the odds of uh, a hunter harvest deer being positive cumulatively in, in that area is one in 142, roadkill one in, in 80, suspect one in nine. So only 40, I think 40 suspect animals, but still that uh, gives you some idea of the biases that are involved in some of the different uh, uh, sampling regimes that we have. And those are important to understand. In some cases, for example, uh, if we really are concerned about surveillance across the landscape, that one in nine number looks uh, a lot more uh, 
just a lot better. And so how much more money or how much more promoting should we do across the state in order to encourage people to, to report those suspect deer so that we can, can have an, a means of early detection out there on that landscape? I don't know, but it's, I think it's worth looking at. And then obviously the, the uh, roadkill harvest um, also is, uh, is, is more. If you look at the total number of, of samples within that DMA, uh, you can see that the roadkills are, are higher, uh, but uh, still we had a, a, a very good uh, hunter harvest also. Again, here's our DMA. DMA2 is the gray area to the bottom. DMA3 is at the top. And over to the right, you can see where there's a, a lot of sample density there. That was our original DMA1. That's in that Adams County area where that first uh, survey operation went positive. It's the same one people have been talking about uh, this week um, in reference to that Mississippi Lacey Act case. Um, this year, we stopped that as being a DMA. Uh, it's been over five years. We sampled intensity, intensely in uh, the uh, wild deer population and, and never got a wild deer. Now PDA, um, by statute, can't have a quarantine that, that goes beyond five years. It becomes, under statute, a taking if that occurs. So we, someone would have to buy the farm, essentially. So uh, we did away with that. And then uh, at the same time, you will see you know, the later slides that we extended the DMA all the way over to that boundary as we had a new positive in Franklin County there. DMA3 is up to the top. You'll hear me talk about that in a minute. But at any rate, so you will see, let me back up for a second if I can. Maybe I can't. Well, I guess we go forward. So uh, let's, uh, the previous speaker spoke about antler restrictions. And of course, PDA has a, a three point antler restriction. Uh, it has three up and, and um, uh, a portion of the state or three points in, in the other part of the state. It's very popular, probably 70% of the hunters uh, really like it these days. And so in Pennsylvania, uh, it doesn't matter. So when we take a look at um, the numbers so far, you'll see that right now we're running 54% of the bucks in, total, in the total sample um, are positive as compared to just about 46% of the does. So we don't, right now we're not seeing a big discrepancy uh, in the numbers. And you notice the roadkill uh, are almost 21, 20, almost the same. So, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at this and the politics are always really important. And uh, the hunters love this. We want to get on the ground. We need landowner permission in order to uh, have shooting operations. And given these numbers, and, and looking at the possibility that with almost a million hunters, well, we've got a million hunters in, this, in the state of Pennsylvania, we probably sell around 750,000 <coughs> licenses, but with a churn rate, we certainly got a million hunters. If 10% of them were really angry about this, then um, they, could, they could essentially halt you know, all of our efforts. So, with these numbers, I want to have more facts. Now, what we don't know is we're not uh, looking at taxidermists right now. Now, the, when they took P, the survey operations and placed them under PDA, the taxidermists went along with them. So our law enforcement officers can't go into a taxidermist for any reason now unless they have probable cause. So we can get cooperating uh, taxidermists to help us. And uh, so I was asking Chris Rosenberry, Dr. Rosenberry, who's uh, our deer team leader last week, okay, I said, okay, within that area, we know what we've got uh, uh, for buck doe uh, ratios here now. What, how many samples would it take from the, the butchers testing the, the older age bucks to determine whether or not there was a bias uh, in, in that sample that's unaccounted for here? And uh, he said around 500. And of course, it would have to come from the same DMA area. So I think uh, we may not be able to get 500 in a single year, but I think that's a, a worthy experiment to, to, to take a look at to, to see is there a bias there? And if there is a bias, then obviously if it's consistent from year to year, then we would be able to adjust for it um, if we didn't want to continue sampling uh, the, the uh, taxidermist. Of course, there's political reasons for wanting to test the taxidermists, our, our executive office wants us to engage those folks, but I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, we've got a lot to chew already. 
uh, if we're going to engage the taxidermists, then maybe we can do an experiment like this so that we can do it in a way that we actually learn something uh, as we do it. So what's gone on? 2012, we had the first three cases. And then uh, last year, 2016, we got, we got more uh, positives last year than we got cumulatively in all the previous years. And as it stands right now, we're at 14 before hunting season starts. So um, almost certainly that's going to go above the 25 number uh, this year. So we're following the same kind of graphic trends that you see. This is raw data, and uh, but you see we, we really didn't have a, a lot of sampling effort differences amongst the years. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's not honed down statistically, but it still gives you a, a trend that looks similar to the trends you, you're seeing in the other states. <clears throat> Of course, we've, we've had a little bit of discussion um, is the iceberg concept uh, in epidemiology. Uh, we know that there are deer out there that uh, can be taken, that are infected, and that they're uh, not going to be detectable uh, by the, the typical methods that we use. So um, there can be reasons why if we, we remove animals from the landscape, uh, we still have it recur if we're not able to, to detect and, and properly quantify how many or what percentage of the pop population out there that is positive. So these are the three th first three counties, our first three cases that we have. You can see the Maryland border, you can see Altoona, and uh, they're spread out about 20 miles apart from north to south <coughs> along a ridge. Uh, they were about 30, 35 miles <coughs> north of the Maryland border. Uh, some folks would say they walked up from Maryland, but I'm highly skeptical. If you notice on this, you notice all the ridges on this map. There's a, a lot of uh, uh, ridges that uh, are probably going to inter, inter, have an impact on uh, the movements of deer. Uh, Penn State now, for a couple of years now, has been working on a genetic studies for us in this area, uh, looking to characterize um, uh, subpopulation or, or differentiate uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, population structure within that area, and they have uh, found structuring in that area, which I, I think is interesting. Now you watch the pattern, I'm going to click through it. So there's our first three cases. Now two of those were two, a 30 month plus old deer, and the other one was an 18 month old, uh, two, uh, two bucks and a doe. So we put immediately we put a, um, a DMA around that area, and within that we put in place feeding and baiting bands as well as parts, uh, parts movement uh, bands so you, you could not re remove any high risk parts out of that area. <clears throat> now a caveat being, of course, um, the, the captive servant operations have no such uh, ban on, on movement of parts out of that area, which is a problem. Oops, stop moving some, for some reason. Oops, or did I? So this is 2014. You can see how they, they should fill in here. My clicker's not clicking. For some reason. Or by the time it does, I'll do something I really don't want. Battery problem? It might be. It might just go and hit the, hit the button on the keyboard there. It should advance the slide. That didn't work. Numlock, maybe. It's not moving. Did it? Yeah, it went to Okay, so now you see how they're it's building in in that area. Let's try it again. Let's try it again here. I'm having a problem. What did you do to make that one work? Oh, there. Did that work? So I'll just use this button. Okay. Yeah, here I'll get some fresh. So I'll buy, see if I can back up to 2016. So anyhow, you can see how it has. Um, the dispersal or the, the um, uh, expansion of the 
population, the infected population seems to be moving down and oddly it skipped to the east a little bit as it moved down along that ridge, which surprises me because you can see there are several very steep ridges in between there. And um, here we are in 2017, now perhaps causative, perhaps not, we'll have some arguments, but all of a sudden in, in 2017, we've got three new positive farms down here. Now, um, the positive farm to the extreme east uh, is in Franklin County. Uh, that farm had an animal show up, it's a shooter operation, and it showed up and had been on that farm for three months. And it came from the middle farm, which is in Fulton County, uh, which uh, at that at a time was a, a trace farm. And last January, we went to that farm and we saw a population of about 150 deer adjacent to the farm in a field. So we went and shot a sample of 30 deer there, uh, trying to get a, uh, we, we figured we had a 95% a chance of detecting um, a positive with a 10% prevalence level. We got one uh, within 600 yards of, of that farm. And that farm um, at that point was just a traceback farm, but within the month, a uh, positive deer was found on that farm. That farm remains um, quarantined at this time. It has both a um, HCP, a certified herd, and a um, HMP uh, within close, close proximity. And the deer, I do believe, came out of the HCP herd. So that herd is uh, sitting there now. The herd to the uh, west there is the positive uh, farm that was spoken of earlier, uh, where they uh, took 157 deer off and 27 of those were, were positive. That's uh, a depopulated farm now. So um, there, there has been activity down there. And uh, this is a radar map of um, looking where those are. And you can see up to the north, we'll talk about DMA3 in a minute. Still having advancing problems. Oops, there it goes. Hmm. Just wonder if I jumped over something. At any rate, so um, what we've done this year, it, we, we've taken and uh, placed two what we call DMAP units uh, within that area. And what we're getting set up to do is um, to um, try to, to better monitor uh, within that area as we go forward, placing some research in there also. So uh, what we're doing is we're putting uh, uh, drop boxes in place uh, that look like these big clothing bins where you can put drop boxes in uh, with the bag deer. We're encouraging the hunters to put them in there and we're uh, telling them that we'll run a rapid ELISA test on them for them. So we're trying to increase our sample density and at the same time uh, we're interested in looking at the distribution of deer uh, harvests through those period of time, uh, through, through those areas. Understanding that we know that uh, deer distribution is patchy. We also know that uh, deer hunters don't randomly uh, hunt on the ax on the landscape either. So we're hoping that maybe we could uh, send maps. Uh, we, we'll know the town from the, the, the tags where they harvested the deer. We'll send out a little map with a UTM grid on there and say, hey, put your put your, put an X in the box where you, you took the deer. And we're hoping that we could better assess um, uh, where, where deer are taken across the landscape, the negatives as well as the positives. Because you'll notice it's almost linear right along that ridge and to the left and right um, of that line, we have farmland. And uh, so that's a wooded ridge with farmland to the sides. Is the hunting density the same out there or not? Or, you know, is the deer density the same out there or not? Uh, those are questions I think that are important. And also getting the, um, the total number of samples, the sample uh, density there up high enough, because if we can go in and we intend to go in and do targeted removal, and we would like to be able to detect with some confidence whether or not we've succeeded or failed in trying to reduce the prevalence in the area. Uh, we've got Penn State uh, involved with a, we're gonna have a research project that begins this winter. We're gonna GPS collar deer uh, at a site where we intend to, to shoot the following year and try to, try to look at the uh, behavior of the deer um, and see if there are any um, immigration uh, issues that uh, that we we can find with those we may use proximity collar pro proximity locators to to uh, look at interactions among deer 
um, and uh, look at other elements uh, of, of deer behavior as we go forward with this. And so we're trying to set things up so that um, uh, we can actually determine success or failure with the, uh, the actions that we try to take in the future. So here's uh, just an example. We've got decals uh, that will be going on these this, that will um, be prettier than this and uh, uh, tell the hunters what we're doing and what to do in order for, for us to get heads. We're hiring additional uh, limited term staff to run to these so that uh, within a day or two, we'll be get collecting the heads out of these boxes um, and then moving forward. So these boxes, uh, drop boxes will be dispersed around these areas. And we also have um, dumpsters, line dumpsters for high risk parts. So we're encouraging everybody that uh, harvest deer to put their high risk parts in these dumpsters if they don't already have uh, garbage, garbage that's going to a line landfill. So uh, we're trying to, to provide services to the hunters as well as at the same time encouraging them to help us with our, our data needs. Yeah, just a Penn State study. Doesn't want to work again. Oops, there it goes. So, um, and I, and I tell folks, of course, I've been giving talks all around Pennsylvania, 40 or 50 of them so far, every place from legislatures to the, the deer farmers to um, uh, hunting organizations and groups around the state. And I tell them, CWD rides in the back of a truck when it goes long distances, whether it's high risk parts, whether it's uh, movement of life service, whether it's contaminated feed, you know, whether it's urine, if, if urine's even possible, whatever. Uh, most of the time it's humans that are moving things around when it's going long distances. So um, why is that important? Because we have the ability to do something about that as opposed to the, the buzzards flying overhead or the, you know, the, the birds. So we might as well focus on the things that we, we know are issues that uh, uh, we may be able to do something about. Now this uh, has already been shown uh, a little bit earlier. This, uh, was done a thesis by a thesis uh, in 2012. Dr. David Walter from Penn State is actually working on a uh, revised version of this now. And he's also looking at uh, the interstate movement of cervids uh, in a similar way. I have not seen the results of those yet. But uh, this gives you an idea. This is from PDA. This is the distribution of, of cervid operations in Pennsylvania. And you can see the, HC per, the HCP herds, the certified herds are yellow and the HMP herds are, are blue. Um, very high density, uh, right back down in that area where look how dark it is, in that area where everything crosses. You'll notice that um, there's a high density of cervid operations in that same area. Now this map is a map, These all these red dots are maps of um, escape events in the last nine years in Pennsylvania from Pennsylvania deer farms. There's 487 escape events I have on here, uh, amounting to more than 1,500 deer, of which um, it appears that less than 10% of those, or around 10% of those, were never recovered. So um, you can see that uh, um, there's a problem. A uh, big concern recently, within the last couple of months, see that red dot? We've got a new positive animal in DMA-3. DMA-3 was formed around two captive cervid farms uh, that were positive in 2014. There was never any positive animals in spite of the fact that we put um, you know, roadkill uh, contracts in place up there and hunter harvest. Um, we never had a, a positive and all of a sudden we get one. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, only six deer were tested last year in a township in which that deer was taken, and that township was about 70 square miles. Um, so, and we have no clue where those deer were tested from. So uh, the only lucky thing about this is that it's on state game lands. We own the land, we own 80% of the land there. And so we intend this winter to go there, and drive a circle around that and try to kill all the deer uh, in that area. I've been up talking to landowners, they're supportive. Um, and so we're gonna uh, attempt to do uh, a call there. And if nothing else, uh, determine whether or not we have uh, an infection 
that has taken hold in that population or with a great deal of luck, maybe it's a, just an initial case. We were very concerned. You will notice the elk range right there. Pennsylvania has elk. We've got around 1,100 elk in that, that uh, yellow area there. Um, it's 10 miles from that positive to the elk range. And uh, we did have uh, elk come across the I-80 there uh, not long ago. And we shot one of them uh, because we knew the rut was coming on and they were bound to go back. And of course, I also wanted to do it just to get attention that uh, we have a problem here and that we need to be paying attention and that we're gonna come up here and, and try to take some actions. So distance, 35 miles from the closest positive down in, in uh, DMA2. Um, very rugged country between there and, and that positive. Um, some would argue, well, maybe it walked up there from there, but I think the more parsimonious uh, uh, answer is that it's awfully close to uh, within four miles of some of the quarantine farms that were left over from that uh, 2014 depopulation. But you can see as far as sample density is concerned, you can see our roadkill deer around the, the, the margin. Of course, you, we don't have any way of knowing where the hunter harvested deer were, were collected, but we don't have good sample density there at all. So we've made, now made all of this DMA3 a DMAP unit and issued uh, extra DMAP permits to the tune of uh, extra two deer. We want to take an extra two deer per square mile out of there, again, with drop boxes and, and dumpsters uh, to increase that sample density up, up there uh, so we can learn more about whether or not it's more widespread in that area than we thought. So there, again, the yellow ones were quarantine farms. So the triangular one up the top there was one of the ones that was depopulated. These were associated farms that were uh, no deer on, on the ones that uh, the arrow goes to right now, but uh, they, they had deer and they were quarantined. Of course, I've discussed this. So we're, we're planning to use uh, uh, targeted removal, sharpshooting, you know, looking at what Illinois and Missouri have been doing, uh, same kind of thing. Um, and again, with the, uh, you know, my thinking is, going back onto the animal restriction thing again, yes, we know the juvenile bucks are, uh, are dispersing, but, um, I think I think it would be wiser to take them out during the winter while they're still fawns before they disperse, uh, start dispersing in the fall. And so, um, you know, again, it's good that different states are doing things a little bit different, especially if we can put in place um, the science, the, the research, the, the sampling, such that we can determine whether or not we have success or failure with one or the other methods. Um, because if everybody does the same thing and, uh, we'll never know whether or not uh, there might be a better mousetrap. Now, in terms of cost, just like uh, Missouri was showing, our, our costs uh, have been going up. And right now we're looking with, with everything that we're planning to do with the new research and, and um, uh, enhanced effort, we're expecting this to go about $2 million uh, immediately. So I'm expecting that uh, our cost curve will go up. And uh, every time we get a new flyer someplace else, then those costs are going to increase ex exponentially. So when we start talking about risk, you know, oh, well, I go back to the urine ban. Again, I think urine is, is probably a low risk myself, but it's certainly not zero risk. So the question becomes, how much risk can we stand when every new case that we have in a remote location is going to cost the state agency hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars through time in order to to address, even if it's possible for them to address them. Now in Pennsylvania, the wild deer hunting um, uh, industry is a $1.6 billion industry a year, comparing to uh, captive surveyed industry, I don't know, tens of millions, maybe, maybe it approaches 100 million, uh, but uh, it's a huge industry for us to lose that. And that's to say nothing about the social values that would be lost if we were to lose uh, deer hunting in Pennsylvania. So uh, how much risk are we willing to take? And it boils down to that. And we know some people want to look at it in terms of, uh, you know, the preponderance of evidence. Some people would like to use the criminal uh, standard of, and so um, anyhow, so legislative um, public outreach is all going on right now. 
Uh, we've been talking. We've had I had 16 um, sports writers in uh, last week, and uh, so we're getting the word out, and things are going pretty well right now. But we always have to worry about the politics, and it's at every level, even within the agencies, trying to get our own staff to accept that we have to do something and change the way that we've been doing things all along. So. We're trying to save deer and deer hunting for people's children and their grandchildren. I'm going to find a place to hunt for the rest of my life since I'm so old.